Welcome to the Love Lab Podcast, a safe place to get real about sex. Whether you're a man, woman, single, or couple, this is the show for you. We are your hosts, Kevin Anthony and Celine Remy, and we are here to guide you to go from good to amazing in the bedroom and beyond. All right, welcome back to the Love Lab Podcast. This is episode 169. You just wanted to say that number. Absolutely. 69. I remember when it was just episode 69. <laughs> and it's all about the 69 position. Now not today. That's right. Now we're 100 times 69. <laughs> and this is why we're going to be talking today about sex drive and whether sex drive declines with age. All right. Yeah, we have a packed episode for you we might even have to go through it, some of it a little fast we will do our best because we have so much information for you so the question and the premise of this episode is does sex drive decline with age and it is generally believed that that is a normal thing that happens you get older and you lose your sex drive and that's that well we are going to bust that wide open with science today <laughs> but before we get started let's give a big shout out to our sponsors power and mastery so if you want to join the secret club of men who are great in bed then check out power and mastery at powerandmastery.com it is the most complete sexual mastery training for men whether you want to have harder erections last longer or increase your sexual skills there is something for you at powerandmastery.com all right. So we're going to start out with a short list of reasons why your sex drive may be low. But I think we'll probably just kind of quickly read them because we're going to go into much, much more detail about each one of these things as we go through the show. You have to understand that your body functions as a one unit and it's like it's a whole system. When something in the body is not operating properly, it's going to affect everything else. So when you are thinking about your libido, sometimes people are like, well, it's just my sex drive. That's just that. But there are many factors that can, that can uh, contribute to having a low sex drive. The most important one and the number one really is all about your hormones and we will come back and most specifically your testosterone now i'm going to say it right now is testosterone while being mostly considered a male sex hormone is essential for women as well and is also responsible for women's sex drive but we'll get back to that in a few minutes it was just to give you a little teaser now medications can affect your sex drive as well as health issues and you know we separated these two because some people take medications for like depression um, or different different issues in their bodies and that will affect them but also health issues like high blood pressure diabetes all of these if your circulation is not working well uh, if your blood sugar levels is off it's going to affect your adrenalines it's going to affect your hormones so it's kind of all tie in together and of course there are the outside factors like stress which is going to raise your cortisol level which then comes back to uh, lowering your your uh, hormones. And then if you have uh, mental things like poor body image, uh, you have just like, you don't really love yourself, you don't like yourself, you know, you are overweight, which could go into a health issue as well, but then you don't like what you see. And last but not least, and maybe most important too, the a lack of use. Use it or lose it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I put that one on the list because you know, I find that if we have a particularly busy or stressful period of time, you know, stuff's happening and we're not having sex as frequently, I tend to think about it less and want it less. Um, I know that sounds counterintuitive because a lot of people say, oh, geez, when I haven't had sex in a while, that's all I can think about. But that's true when the reason you haven't had sex in a while is simply because you don't have a partner or you don't have a girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever at the time. But like when life really gets in the way, like when stuff gets, you know, pretty serious and you got health issues or family issues or, you know, like serious stuff going on with work, it's generally one of the last things that you think of. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll get back to literally every one of these soon. 
All right. So now you know why your sex drive is low if you find yourself in there. And as you can see, it's not just, oh, you're aging. Not at all. There's all these factors. Yeah. So I found, you know, rarely ever go to Wikipedia for anything <laughs> because, you know, we call them fakeopedia. But <laughs> but sometimes on certain subjects, they do have some decent information. And I really liked um, how they defined what makes our sex drive. So I'm just going to read that to you real quick. So libido, also known as sex drive, is a person's overall sexual drive or desire for sexual activity. In psychoanalytic theory, libido is psychic drive or energy particularly associated with sexual instinct, but also present in other instinctive desires and drives. Libido is influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors. Biologically, the sex hormones and associated neurotransmitters that act upon the nucleus, uh, accumbens, primarily testosterone, dopamine, social factors such as work and family, and internal psychological factors such as personality and stress. So, and you know, they talk about it can be affected by a bunch of different things. But the, the reason why I liked this particular explanation is because most people think of lack of sex drive as being associated with two different things. You get old or your hormones are messed up. And if when you get old, it's because your hormones are messed up. Right? So basically, people always think it just comes down to hormones. And what I liked about this definition is that it does a good job of explaining it's not just hormones. So like we gave you in that little list in the beginning, there's a bunch of other things like social factors, psychological factors, as well as the actual physical biological factors that can all affect your, your sex drive. And we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, as we get into the hormone thing, but I, cause that's coming up pretty much next. I wanted to sort of uh, maybe warn the audience. Don't get so caught up in the hormone thing. Okay. So like we need to have a very short discussion about something here before I let Celine really go on about the hormones <laughs> in modern science today. They will tell you that everything is, you know, oh, it's genetic. It's genetic. It's genetic because we found a gene that controls this thing. Therefore, it's all just genetic. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, that's not really true. Um, and that's not the scope of this episode. So I'll just leave it at that. It's not true. If you want to know more, send us an email. Maybe we'll uh, do an episode on that. But the same is true with hormones. So science is going to tell you that if your hormone level is this, then this is totally what your experience is going to be. And this is how you're going to feel things. And that's not necessarily true either. And we have personal experience having our hormone levels tested and having it say one thing, but us actually having a real experience completely opposite of what the hormone numbers say. So I just kind of want to warn you that when we talk about this, yes, this is generally scientifically true when we talk about hormones. But if you hear something like, oh, yeah, I had my testosterone checked and it was low, so therefore I'm just never going to have a sex drive again. No, don't allow your brain to go there because that part is the part that's not true. You know, I want to bring the concept too that your biggest sex organ is what's between your ears. Again, I will say what we say all the time. You don't have to be in the mood. You can create the mood and that there is a correlation between feeling sexual energy and feeling energy, period, like creativity energy and moving this energy in your body. So what I've noticed is when we do particular meditations where we learn to circulate our energy into our bodies, we often feel aroused by doing this particular meditation and you're like well you're sitting down and meditating and using your mind to move this energy how can that be well because again sexual energy is energy right and so when you start to create circulation and movement then you start to feel some sensations and then you don't have to constantly base your sexual activity on your sex drive level, because again, you can simply be focusing on what lovemaking brings to you. And even if you're not as horny or as turned on, you can get there if you give yourself enough time and the proper environment. Yes. So let's just talk briefly about the neurotransmitters 
neuropeptides, and sex hormones that affect sex drive by modulating activity in or acting upon the pathways that generate sexual desire. Ooh. Ooh. All right. So number one is testosterone. It's directly correlated, right? And other androgens. So androgens are more what would be considered the uh, male hormones. And we all have the same hormones, by the way, men and women. However, we have different quantities of them, which is what uh, makes the difference. And this is also why we have such differences between different men or different women, because they have a different balance in their hormones. So then the opposite to the testosterone would be the estrogen, uh, which is related in other hormones that are female sex hormones. Just, just go ahead, read the whole list. The uh, progesterone, which is fascinating. We will talk more about progesterone. We've been doing a lot of research on that and using things on ourselves. Uh, but again, like there is a correlation with low progesterone, which also can create low testosterone. So all these hormones work together. And when one is off balance, it will affect the other one. Of course, there's the oxytocin. You know, the oxytocin is what you get when you share a hug with somebody, when you you have that, it's just kind of that bonding hormone. There's the serotonin and norepinephrine and acetylcholine. Ooh. Woohoo. So those are, you know, if you're experiencing low libido and you've ruled out things like social and psychological factors, and you think it might be a physical biological thing, those are the places to start to look. What are your levels of those different neurotransmitters and neuropeptides? And we're going to we're going to dive into them definitely a little bit more here. And also when you're playing with hormones, understand that it is not, it's a significant thing. It, it will have repercussions and it's important to have somebody who understands hormone to support you through the process. It's important to measure things and understand that there are different things like testosterone. There's the free testosterone. I mean, there's different levels. Same with your estrogens, three different estrogens. So you have to be, I would say like supervised through that process, because if you want to be really successful and look at the nitty gritty, I want to come back to the testosterone because really testosterone is what is essential both for men and women. And we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between men and women. So testosterone is mainly produced in the testicles for the men. It starts at puberty and the testosterone levels start to increase significantly in males. So during this period of growth, testosterone is responsible for the uh, cracking and eventual deepening of a male's voice, uh, the growth of facial and body hair, the muscle mass, the increased strength, increased testosterone, uh, all the results of that increased testosterone during puberty. And, you know, we, they all come at a different time. Testosterone is known as the male sex hormone, majorly due to its impact to, on the male sexuality. So it plays a key role in libido, in sex drive, as well as erections, along with sperm and seminal fluid production. So when testosterone levels are healthy, a man can have a healthy sexuality, a healthy libido, and all of this. If they are too low, then it can affect a man's sexuality as well as his moods. He may experience lots, loss of muscle mass and bones, density, uh, loss of facial and body hair, weight gain, especially around the middle, and fatigue or depression. These are all signs that um, Men are low in their testosterone. You know, now would probably be a good time to talk about the tests that everybody has done for testosterone in a sense that they don't always test for the right thing. And so you'll get a number back that may be high or low, but it may not be telling you the whole story. Hmm. And that's an important point to make. And I mean, you, you know a little bit more about that as far as the free testosterone versus. Well, the, the only thing to understand, too, is that people usually don't have a baseline. So most people don't check themselves on their testosterone when they are at their peak, probably around their 20s. Right. And so then they go to the doctor later in life and they go like, well, 
um, you're still considered normal, but there's a wide range. I forgot the, if, I think if it's between 300 and 900 is still considered normal. Anything below is considered low, something like that. Uh, but the problem is if you, let's say you were at 800 and then you're at 400, you're half of what you used to be, which is low for you. But if you used to be about 650 and now you're 400, it's not that much of a big jump. So it's important to understand that. I mean, one of the like sure tell signs is related to your erections. Do you wake up with a morning wood? If you don't and you don't have spontaneous erections and it has, doesn't happen in the morning, then your testosterone is too low for you. I don't care what the numbers say. If your body is not showing up, if your body is not responding, then the, the testosterone you are producing in less time, or maybe you have too high levels of estrogen, which is inhibiting the testosterone or the process of how it breaks down. And when, it, when the testosterone breaks down in a way that's not good, it turns into uh, estrogen in the body, more of the female hormone. So there's something happening that's not quite right. Yeah. And that's kind of the point I wanted to make is that you might get a test number that says low, but then look at what you're experiencing. If you have six pack abs and you have no problem putting on muscle mass in the gym and you wake up every morning with a rock solid erection and you have desire for sex all the time, don't pay so much attention to that number. <laughs> now let's look at the uh, female counterpart. So the woman produces, um, they produce testosterone in their ovaries, adrenal glands, and the fat cell. But it's different from how men produce the hormone. During puberty, women experience an increase in estrogen, which is the hormone responsible for all of their bodily change, you know, the hips, the breasts, and, you know, the fats, the cellulite. Though they do still produce a level of testosterone, it's only about one seventh of the amount that men produce. The main function of testosterone in a woman's body is sexuality, though there are a couple hundred of other use for it. Just as with men, women who experience low testosterone levels can experience low sexual arousal and libido. I wanted to quickly mention a study. The study was performed in 2003, so it's not recent by any means, and there probably are other ones that have been done. But the study was performed and the compared women who were menopausal and had low libido and they gave them uh, testosterone or estrogen and then they looked at what happened. So the investigator found that boosting testosterone levels was associated with increased sexual desire in women who complained of menopause related low libido and reduced sexual arousal. Women taking a low dose estrogen testosterone combination treatment reported a two-fold improvement in sexual interest compared with women treated with estrogen alone. What that really means is it's not your estrogen that gives you sexual desire. It is your testosterone. When you address the testosterone and yes, it is a male hormone, but it is part of what makes our sex drive happen. When you correct that in very low dose, again, supervised, you don't want to just like do it like this because you can go too far the other end. It will increase your sexual libido. And even though people are thinking, well, we don't really know. There's no proof. There has been enough studies. And I think just try it, try it with women, enough women who are seeing positive results for doing that for themselves. Yeah. And, you know, we'll get to it when we get more into what can you do if you have low libido. So I don't want to jump ahead and go too much into this, but I do again want to sort of caution the audience that the fix isn't always go get pumped up with hormones, right? <laughs> Most likely what you need to do is address an underlying imbalance in your body that's creating your hormones to be out of balance. So in other words, you know, if you have a low level of a particular hormone, the solution isn't necessarily to go have somebody inject a bunch more of that hormone into you because it doesn't solve the underlying condition of why was it low to begin with, right? So we'll talk more about that. But as we're talking about all of these different hormone things and potentially supplementing with hormone therapies, keep in mind that should really be a last resort and always, always, always done under the supervision of not just a medical doctor, but a medical doctor that truly understands hormones. And honestly, there aren't very many of them out there. Lots of them will tell you that they do, but they really, truly don't understand how this works. Mm -hmm. So to come back to the question of today's show, does the sex drive decline with age? As you can see, we go through changes and fluctuations in life. So are things different? Yes. 
they are. We're not going to say that it's the same because even if you look at your body, the way you looked at 15 or 20 versus the way you look at 40 is not the same. The, the quality of your skin, the different things. But do you have to go downhill from there? Absolutely not. No, but there are some really great things I found on the effects of age Ooh. and your libido and your hormones. All right. So let's take a quick break for our sponsor before you start telling us all about what happens as we age. So this is for you guys, couples who are committed, but yet feel stuck in a rut and just going through the daily motions instead of connecting the way you used to. If you are tired of stale mechanical sex that lacks spontaneity and fun, and you don't want to live a life of average, then Kevin and I would like to invite you to join a highly sexed power couple platinum program. So if you give us 90 days, we will help you bring the passion back between the sheets and be synced up sexually so that you can thrive with more purpose and passion in life mm, and reclaim that libido. So go to CelineRemy.com forward slash passion to learn more about our program. Okay, so let's talk about what happens as you get older Ooh. and how that affects your sex life, your libido, your sex drive. But Kevin, so we don't age. Well, I don't age. <laughs> I'm 75. You wouldn't even know it. <laughs> You're so not. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Anyway. All right. So we got to start way back in the beginning. <laughs> so the surge in testosterone hits the male at puberty, resulting in sudden and extreme sex drive, which reaches its peak at age 15 to 16 and then drops slowly over his lifetime. So the reason why that's kind of important to understand is that literally 15 or 16, you're maxing out with the amount of testosterone, and then it's going to slowly decline yeah. over the years. So if you're 50 or 60, you're a long way past 15 or 16, right? And so all of those years, it's been dropping a little bit, especially if you have not maintained a healthy lifestyle. So that's kind of something that's important to know. In contrast, however, a female's libido increases slowly during adolescence and peaks in her mid 30s. Well, I would I would say that's true. I'm experiencing that peak right now. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> well, and that is actually really important to know and and you know, in society you've heard this all the time, right? You've heard about the horny, you know, young teenage boys that just want to fuck all the time, right? And then you've heard that, well, you know, it's really not, it's the older women, the cougars, right? That really want to have sex all the time. There is some truth to that because of the way the hormones change and fluctuate. Uh, actual testosterone and estrogen levels that affect a person's sex drive vary considerably. This is kind of what we were talking about before. Most people don't have a base range, so they don't actually know what's normal for them. People in their 60s and early 70s generally retain a healthy sex drive, but this may start to decline in the early to mid 70s. So, you know, in today's society, I mean, people are literally saying like, by the time you're in your 40s, you're already like losing your sex drive and in decline. But what the stats tell us is that people still have a healthy sex life in their 60s and 70s. And it's generally not until you know, more like mid-ish 70s or so that they start experiencing a decline. Which that would be a correlation because that's also when a lot of the health challenges it's start health to pile challenges. up. And then mm -hmm. it makes it, you know, because all the process work a little bit slower. And if you have a fall or if you have a, I don't know, virus or anything, it usually takes you much more time to come back up to that strength. And then if you add two, three things in a row, then you kind of like really down. And the medications you take generally increase. So you actually just hit on my next bullet point, which is <laughs> older adults generally develop a reduced libido due to declining health and environmental or social factors. So all this talk about hormones, and it turns out the stats actually say that older adults generally develop a reduced libido due to declining health, environmental, and social factors. In contrast to common belief, postmenopausal women often report an increase in sexual desire and an increased willingness to satisfy their partner. Oh, wait a minute. Does this mean that after you go through menopause, it's not true that you no longer want to have sex? You just want to like knit and hang out with your girlfriends? <laughs> no, 
For no. some women it is, but for others it's not. And the women often report family responsibilities, health, relationship problems, and well-being as inhibitor to their sexual desires. So when you no longer have the burden of being careful to be pregnant, suddenly there's a newfound freedom. When you no longer have your kids at home, when you can find time for yourself, have self-care and stuff, suddenly your libido returns because you have a little bit more energy for yourself. That's very fascinating. But what that means is whatever you believe to be true, is going to be true for you. So if you are set on the idea that it is normal to age and that you have a decline in libido, that's most likely what you are going to experience. If you are set on the idea that, well, while my body will change, maybe the way I make love will change, my libido and my sex drive can remain and I can still have a healthy sexuality, that is what you are going to experience. Absolutely. And so, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, the hormones and, you know, the, all the things that we listed at the beginning of this show and all of that really comes down to, it doesn't have to be that way. Those things can happen and they can affect your sex drive, but they don't have to. And I would say also that the people that are affected by them are probably significantly fewer than you think. Now, there's still quite a few of them. So I'm not making this out to be like, you know, it's rare that people experience these things. No, they experience them somewhat frequently, but not as much as you think, because in, in our commonly held belief, it's basically everybody that gets older goes through this. And what the data really tells us is, no, that's not actually true. So that begs the question, what can you do to increase your sex drive? If you like, okay, fine. Now I understand it doesn't have to go downhill. There might be things I can do. And I'm glad you asked because we have some answers for you. <laughs> yes, we do. We have a whole list here of things that you can do to increase your sex drive. Number one, eat more fat. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we said it on the Love Lab podcast. Fat is an essential nutrient. In order to produce hormones, you need to have enough fat. So all these low-fat diets are really, really bad for you. Good, healthy fat. Now we gotta be clear, it's not just to eat like tons of bacons while there, you know, there is some good fats. It's better to go with uh stay away from the processed trans fats, the hydrogenated hydrogenated crappy oils and all that stuff. Healthy oils, olive oil, avocado oil, avocados themselves, coconut oil, yeah, ghee, raw butter, this type of things will be really good for All you. All organic, of course. Especially with the dairies, otherwise it's going to have hormones which are going to affect your own hormones. Yeah, that's an important point to make is that almost all commercially produced dairy has hormones in it because in order to get the cows to overproduce, they pump them full of hormones mostly estrogen and uh, bovine growth hormones. Yes, bovine recumbent growth hormone, mm -hmm. which is really, really bad for you. And it's pretty much in all the milk because you pump it into the cows, it ends up in the milk. Just like anything you pump into a human mother ends up in her breast milk too, right? So you got to make sure that you're getting this stuff from good sources. And number two, sleep more. Sleep helps to regulate your hormone level. Most people are sleep deprived. And usually there's like a correlation uh, because they get so stressed and then they don't sleep well and the quality of the sleep is not good. And then their body can't produce the, the proper level of hormones. Yeah. And I would add to that because I don't think it's on the list here, but to not do screen time uh, for an hour or two before bedtime. The blue light, because the blue light affects your melatonin production, which um, basically makes it that you won't sleep as deep and you won't be able to release all the cortisol. And then if you have a high stress level, you won't be able to produce the hormones you need to do. Exactly. So that's that. Next on the list, lift weights. Obviously, men love to get toned and chiseled for cheek. Well, some do. Some do <laughs> I don't know. I look around in society and I go, not, not enough of them really love that, but, but well, some do. But regardless, both men and women should be lifting weights. And okay, I got to speak to you as a professional here. I used to work at a very high end club, spa as a personal trainer when I was in my 20s. Uh, my fellow trainers were literally Olympic athletes. We, we, we worked at that high of a level. So I have significant experience here. And I can honestly tell you, I had so 
many female clients that would come to me and say, well, you know, I, I want you to train me, but, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to get all buff. Like I don't want to have giant muscles. I don't want to look like a dude, you know? And I would put them through some pretty hard workouts and they would say this all the time. Like, are you sure I should be doing this? I don't want to look like a dude. I can tell you that anytime you see female bodybuilders or even female fitness competitors who have larger than normal muscles for a woman, they had help in some way. And I'm not saying that they're all on steroids, although many of them most likely are. You could, as a regular person eating a normal diet and going into the gym and working out hard on weights, you're never going to bulk up like a man. You're just not, unless you're one of those odd women that naturally just happens to have an unusually large amount of testosterone, which some do that happens. But for your average normal woman, this is not going to happen. And if I wanted to train a woman to be that big, we would have to pull out every trick in the book. We would have to be having her take, you know, um, testosterone precursors, you know, things to help her body try to produce more. And we'd have to be giving her tons of protein. We'd have to, there's a lot of things we would have to do to make that happen. And it is not easy to do. <laughs> Let's continue with our list of things you can do. You need to get some sunshine because it will help you with your vitamin D. And we have talked about vitamin D in the past and it's pretty much everybody is kind of too low in their vitamin D. And the, the problem is even when you fall within the normal. So for example, when we tested our vitamin D, we had been supplementing. We do a lot of naked sun time, spend a lot of time outdoor, but we still do work indoors. And I was very surprised that my level was basically at the bottom of the normal at 30, like that the bottom part of it. I expected it to be so much higher because I took my supplements. And it's only when I started to increase basically tenfold the amount of vitamin D that I was supplementing with, that my levels have gone much higher. Yeah. So there's a couple of things to say here. First of all, somebody just commented on one of our YouTube videos and they said, oh, only 40% of people are, are deficient in vitamin D. Not true. At, in today's present time, literally 100% of people, unless you live outdoors because you're, you live in a tribe somewhere in Africa or South America, if that's not your daily experience, you are deficient in vitamin D. So we have to get that out right up front. You are deficient. And how do we know that? Because we were literally supplementing with high quality vitamin D and we get outside every opportunity we can and our numbers still were not high enough. Now, the other thing is, is in order to get that 40% number, the range that they're using for the level of vitamin D is extremely low. So what they're telling you is when you look at like, say, USDA recommendations for a particular supplement, how they determine what that number is, is basically how much do you need to not die? <laughs> like that's how low the number is. And so when they say, oh, well, you're in that normal range because that's the US, you know, RDA is blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. You need, like, like Selene was saying, probably 10 times what they tell you that number is. And so that's how they get to a number like 40%, only 40%, no, 100% are deficient because they don't have anywhere near the levels that they're supposed to have because we live most of our time indoors. Vitamin D is extremely difficult to get through food. And basically you either have to be out in the sun a lot, but not only that, you have to have a significant portion of your body exposed to the sun. So being out in the sun with a t-shirt and a pair of pants on is not, not really cutting it. Well, you, you get a little on your arms and your face. That's not enough. You actually, you would have to be outside. We, we figured this out one day. It was like- Like eight hours? It was like eight hours a day naked <laughs> every day in order to get enough vitamin D. That, that's how much you'd have to be out there. So you just can't do it without supplementing. And by the way, little side notes, so vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's basically a hormone precursor. FYI, which also in turn will affect how your hormones play in. So if you have low vitamin D, usually you'll have low hormone level as right, well. Because your body needs the vitamin D to produce the hormone. You want to avoid plastics to minimize the estrogen, which constricts with the testosterone. So uh, anything that's, uh, you know, BPA and all of these things. I yeah, mean, this so is a whole episode and I it, think we're just going to. It, it is. I will say this. This is a silent epidemic. 
It yes. is literally a silent epidemic. You are exposed to massive amounts of phytoestrogens, which means plant estrogens, and xenoestrogens, which basically are man-made chemical estrogens. They're in everything, every can, basically. And you know, everyone went crazy in this fad. It's all BPA-free now, so you don't have to worry. You realize there's literally, and I'm not joking, I'm not making this up, BPA, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on through the alphabet. And most of those other ones, A is the only one they took out. <laughs> and they just replaced it with other ones. That way they, because the public only knows A. So we just tell them there's no more A in it. Oh, what about B or C or D, right? So you're exposed to massive amounts of these things and they are messing up your hormones big time. Um, I want to talk about not going too much for steady cardio. For most people, uh, cardio is detrimental and they would do much better with high intensity training or weightlifting in order to, because again, we are looking at what can increase the hormone, what can create the body to produce more sex drive. And that's this type of activities that would do that. Yeah. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with cardio and judging by the size of most people I see walking around in the streets, they need some cardio, but excessive cardio could actually deplete your hormones. Yes. You want to look at things that like reducing your exposure to radiation or like EMF, electromagnetic frequencies, if you're subjective to that as well. Because again, most of the time, the EMFs will um, mess up again with your sleep cycles and with your melatonin production. And it just, if you think about it, we are in physical body, but we are made of like, everything is electricity to electrical, right? And those waves, they are messing with our electrical bodies. Um, so for sure, some people are more sensitive than others. And so it's important to understand that, like probably wearing your cell phone uh, on your breasts or in your pocket by your penis, all of these things will affect and make a lot of radiation in areas that you do not want to be radiated. This is yet another silent epidemic. I mean, literally an epidemic. Everything is wireless. Your refrigerator is wireless now. Your washing machine is wireless. Everything is wireless. You are completely inundated with electromagnetic frequencies. And as Celine rightly pointed out, your body is electrical. And all of those frequencies are messing up with your body's ability to function the way it's supposed to function. And they know it. They absolutely know it. And they just won't tell you because they'll lose millions of dollars because you'd have to get rid of all this great technology. I'm going to go quickly because we're getting close towards the end of the show. Um, a few more things that you can do. Look at the micronutrients and minerals in your diet because the soils are now depleted. Most of us are depleted and we need something supplementing to help us with that balance. So there are some fantastic tests. If you work with a naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doctor, they can help you go through that and test your own levels. Again, there's not one size fit all. Everybody processes things differently. You may be exposed to the same food, the same environment, and yet your bodies react differently. So it's important to be, uh, to understand yourself and know yourself. I'm going to talk about alcohol because um, alcohol is really bad on your testosterone level. I know some people say, drink your red wine, and then it's got resveratrol and it's got all of these things. And, you know, I'm a, not a big fan of that. And especially say no to beer, because if you want to have a flat stomach, if you not want to have excess estrogen, you need to stay away from the beer because it's loaded with phytoestrogen. Hops. Yeah, I hate, hate to tell you this, guys, but the beer, you know, a lot, a lot of times guys think, oh, you know, the more beer you can drink, the more of a man sure. he is. It's actually totally the opposite. The more beer you drink, the less of a man you are because you got higher estrogen levels and lower testosterone levels. And while there are benefits in red wine, such as resveratrol, just keep in mind that any benefit that you get is outweighed by the negative effects of the alcohol itself. So get your nutrients elsewhere. And then we're going to talk about do not binge it at night. Um, literally pretty much after 7 p.m. It's best to give your body a rest. Otherwise, your body is going to spend the night digesting the food you've eaten late at night, and it's not going to do the whole um 
digest, repair the body that is needed, and you're going to start to run low on your battery. And of course, last but not least, getting plenty of rest, which is probably one of the hardest things. We were having this conversation this morning, and I'm like, I have to try so hard in my life to be unbusy because the world we live in is designed to make us constantly react, to have distractions, to have things competing for our attention and energy. And sometimes you just have to say, enough, slow down. Like, I want to have this more like unbusy, like, like slower pace life, but it's hard because it's going against the society and the environment that we live in. And we have to work on being relaxed and unbusy. <laughs> yeah. So all of these things pretty much that we talked about here and ways to increase your sex drive are ways to get your body back into balance so that it can produce the hormones that it should be producing and in the proper proportions. Now, you should be doing these things no matter what, but there could potentially be situations where this is not enough and you might need to seek help in balancing those hormones from a medical professional. So just keep that in mind. The place to start, like if you're listening to the show and you're going, well, yeah, my sex drive really isn't what it used to be. Before you run to the doctor, assuming that you don't have any major medical issues, try this first, like really commit to changing your lifestyle and see what effect it has. And if you've really done all of this in good faith, like you really gave it a shot, not just, I tried it for a week and I didn't feel anything kind of bullshit, but if you've really tried it and it takes time, like months of doing this to really get in the routine and start to feel the benefits. If at that point, something hasn't shifted, then you might need to look elsewhere. Absolutely. And I think really you start with moving differently, introducing the, the weight lifting, cleaning up your diet and paying more attention to your sleep to have better sleep. These free changes are, can be incredible in what they can do for yourself. All right. So we have a bonus. A bonus. Now. Whew. We love bonuses. If you've made it all the way to the end of today's show, we're going to give you a few things like can food increase your sex drive? You know, a lot of people talk about aphrodisiac and it's, there's a lot of controversy about it has more to do with your head than anything else. And so aphrodisiacs are a little bit different, like real substantial food can have effect again on your body. I want to say you want to, before we tell you which one to eat, let us tell you which one to not eat. Sugar. Like throw this one away. Like sugar is just not good for you. And sugar is in everything, especially white sugar and processed food. Sugar, processed foods, beer, alcohol in general. Um, those are some of the top ones. Like white flour and all of these type of things. But Even that would be like anything that comes in a package that's like very different from its uh, form that it would look if it was in nature. You should question whether or not you should put that in your body. Yeah. And, you know, certain things like, you know, soy and beer and stuff like that have high levels of estrogens in them. So you want to stay away from that kind of stuff. So let's give you a few things to eat. Eat some seafood like, like tuna and, you know, sardines and anchovies. You can even have cod liver and things like that. Any like fatty fish, really. Look at egg yolks. Some people are just like, oh, I just want egg whites. But really what you need is the egg yolk. You can do things like venison and beef, some, some meat, especially that's like organic or free range. You want to have super high quality quality. You want to increase your leafy green vegetables. So essential and things like also your cruciferous vegetables and your beans and also your spices like ginger, garlic, and a lot of other spices. My um, Ayurvedic physician used to say that one of the biggest problems here in the West is that we are spices deficient. The only thing we use is garlic and salt and pepper. And it's like, what about turmeric and cumin and coriander and fennel? Like all of these different things that people have no understanding, like spices are really essential. Yeah. Her herbs and spices are powerhouses they're literally medicines literally they are. medicines and they're not just oh it makes the bland thing that i'm eating taste better <laughs> yeah it does that too 
but they're literally medicine. And again, there's not one size fit all. We're giving you this list, but you've got to know your body. You've got to know yourself. There's not one diet that fits everyone, uh, but nuts and seeds are important. So there's a lot of research done on pomegranates too, that could be really good for the body and whey protein for those uh, people who can digest that is a good one um, to, in, to help to build some of the mass and mass and the testosterone for, for people. So this food, again, like the good fats and the high quality protein and including the veggies and some nuts and seeds will help you boost your sex drive. All right. Like we Ooh. said, we have a packed show. We, did. we didn't even have a lot of time to go into the social or psychological factors, but they're definitely there. You know, people's attitudes towards sex at certain times in life and, you know, stresses and things that they're going, those are all have effect as well. We just didn't have time to get into it all. We wanted to cover kind of the, the most uh, common and easy to correct type of things, but just know that there are other factors that you may need to look into. And really that's all the time we have for this episode. If you have any questions, send them over to us and maybe uh, we can do another show and go deeper into some of the other topics, but that's all the time we have for this episode and we will see you next week. We hope you like this episode of the Love Lab podcast. If you enjoy this show, subscribe, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. And for more free, exclusive content, join us in the Passion Vault at CelineRemy.com forward slash vault. That's C-E-L-I-N-E-R-E-M-Y dot com forward slash vault. Thanks for listening. And remember, you're amazing.